Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the thumb was engineered, the foot was deviled, and the peter was black, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder what a basket chair is? Or why Watson's medicine of choice is always brandy? Or what a coal scuttle is and why cigars would be there? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Walder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 219, Moriarty and Mathematics. Well, hello and welcome once again to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast, where we talk about the details in the stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you are you ready to add things up here today? I wondered, you know, earlier why I was so uncomfortable. And it turns out, and boy, you'll laugh at this, I've been sitting on my abacus. <laughs> Ow. Ow. I'm not even going to go there. Uh, oh, good. There's, there's, there's so much, uh, so many different directions I could go, but this is a family friendly show and, uh, we want to keep it that way. Well, uh, this is episode 219. The countdown to 221 continues. If you'd like to find the show notes for this episode, they're available at ihose.co slash trifles219. That's where you'll find any links that we have that are relevant to this particular episode, things that we might mention over the next 15 minutes or so. And you can leave us a comment there. That is, uh, that'll take you to the direct show link at SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. You can comment directly on the, uh, the post there. You can always email us back. We are trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com. And we are I Hear of Sherlock all over the social web. And of course, if you haven't checked out our main show yet, our interview program, that is I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, that is a twice a month podcast that is sure to delight, where we talk with interesting uh, Sherlockians who are doing zany, fun, and different things uh, in the world of Sherlock Holmes. So, we thought we would look a little bit into this famous professor of mathematics. We, we looked at professors and Sherlock Holmes in recent episodes. I think it was, oh gosh, it must have been episode, looking back here, uh, in January, episode 211, we looked at the three professors, the only professors that Sherlock Holmes encountered in the Sherlock Holmes stories. Of course, just as a reminder, they were Professor Moriarty, Professor Coram in The Golden Posne, and Professor Presbury in The Creeping Man. So we didn't have uh, too much to discuss specifically about Moriarty other than what we uh, heard of him, just uh, being a retired army coach, etc., we thought we might look into the specifics that Holmes and Watson mentioned with regard to Moriarty's um, academic prowess. He had two major publications that were mentioned. What were those publications, Bert, and, and where do we hear of them? Well, we hear of them in the Valley of Fear. There's this, and the wonderful thing about the Valley of Fear, of course, it's a from the standpoint of being published, it's a later case of Sherlock Holmes, but it's a magnificent novel. And if our listeners haven't read it, now would be a great time. Turn us off. Take that down from the shelf. Read The Valley of Fear. Mm. But what we uh, have there, interestingly enough, is this case appears long after the demise of Moriarty. And so it's, it sort of gives you an opportunity to get Moriarty's backstory. And what happens is... Um, 
uh, it's, this takes place in 1888. And after getting a coded message from one of the people who work with Professor Moriarty, Holmes refers to the professor himself as the celebrated author of the dynamics of an asteroid. And he says it's a book which ascends to such rarefied heights of pure mathematics that it is said that there is no man in the scientific press capable of criticizing it. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that we know from the past, Watson tells us early on in his relationship with Sherlock Holmes, that Holmes knows nothing about astronomy. (laughs) And yet, in the events that followed that observation, which was typically superficial from Watson, uh, Holmes has sat down with his brother Mycroft in The Adventure of the Greek Interpreter and discussed the causes of the change and the obliquity of the ecliptic. But um, And now we have this reference to the dynamics of an asteroid, which uh, you know, one would imagine, since this is Holmes' worst enemy, that Holmes has had a more than um, trifling glance at the book. Hmm. And I think it was back in that uh, episode about the three professors, episode two eleven, when we we talked a little bit a little bit about how Professor Moriarty would have explained the obliquity of the ecliptic to a a civilian, the likes of Inspector <laughs> McDonald, I believe it was, and how he might stand there with a lamp and a globe and move them about to uh, show the the play of shadows and the blocking of the source of light etc um you know when when we read that <laughs> no one else could have understood this work i mean that obviously puts it in a a realm of its own um it's one of those things that well we can't comment on it anymore here because nobody really knows anything about it you know, I mean, you give your, you, you write yourself out of, uh, of, uh, any expectation of being able to explain it. You know, it's, it's so complicated. We can't even begin to describe it to you. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and in that way, it gives you a lovely, um, it, it, you, it allows you to paint in just a few words, a mysterious picture of a truly brilliant person. And in that one sentence, like so many of Conan Doyle's sentences, we have packed in the information that the finest minds could not understand that. So it gets you to the point where we're facing an opponent who's clearly brilliant, clearly beyond anyone who's a current commentator on these things. And the lovely thing about it, too, is that it gives rise to the opportunity to do some imagining about the dynamics of an asteroid and what it might have um, might have uh, led to. And one of the observations, you know, and the interesting thing is when you dig into this, you know, you find out that people did write things about the dynamics of an asteroid. Asteroids, uh, you know, in somewhat, I don't know how particularly interesting it is, but if you look up what is an asteroid, what you find out is that, you know, in the early days of the formation of uh, the solar system, when Jupiter came together, it uh, prevented anything from forming in the gap between Jupiter and Mars. And that caused the small objects that were there to fragment into into asteroids. So you have these things that are like Earth orbiting the sun and had a source in between the gap and between Jupiter and Mars. And so they're flying all around. Well, in 1809, Carl Friedrich Gauss wrote a treatise on the dynamics of an asteroid, but it was understood immediately and is still being used today. And there was a series of books published by a guy named Simon Newcomb about 20 years before Conan Doyle wrote, analyzing the motions of planets in the, in the solar system. Um, but there doesn't seem to be much raw material there. However, one branch of math associated with asteroid dynamics is chaos theory. And this wasn't particularly appreciated by other mathematicians until Poincaré's work around 1890. Um, so this has given rise to some speculation that perhaps Moriarty's book, Dynamics of an Asteroid, offered opinions, insights, early discoveries, developments around chaos theory. Well, I think that makes a heck of a lot of sense, giving, <laughs> given the amount of chaos that he actually introduced into the, <laughs> the criminal world of London. Um, makes great sense. 
Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I, if, if you think about the, uh, the, the, the orbiting bodies of uh, criminality within London, and I'm sure, you know, you could geographically map them, you know, there, where pickpockets actually hung out and uh, where safe crackers were, et cetera. I'm sure there were patterns that could be recognized around the city. And, you know, you think about uh, Moriarty being the great organizer of this, this crime circle, as Holmes said, well, wouldn't it be in Moriarty's best interest and wouldn't it be consistent with his understanding of chaos theory to, in a certain way, disorganize everything and make it chaotic so there are not patterns to be able to be discovered by someone as clever as Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. Well, I like that a lot. You know, and I have not gone back into the Baker Street Journal to look at some of the papers that have been published about this. I sort of, you know, did sort of a very superficial look back on certain things before we picked this particular topic. But um, I'll have to do that. I'm sure there must be some interesting speculation there. However, I know enough about chaos theory to know that um, one, uh, and, and at one point, you know, I had read a lot about fractals and so on. But at one point, there is a characteristic of chaos theory around self-organization. And mm. it, uh, that's where you get to the anecdote about the butterfly effect. Yes. You know, that a butterfly flapping its wings in Texas can cause a hurricane in China. Um, and one of the things I like to think about, and I'm sure people have written about this, is that maybe Moriarty applied chaos theory and the idea of self-organization um, and, and the, the insight that a small change in one state can result in large differences someplace else to uh, his own organization and to the planning of crime. I like that. I like that a lot. And, you know, given given that Holmes, as, as you mentioned there, clearly did not understand um, those things related to the solar system, um, it's quite likely that um, Moriarty may have outfoxed him here um, for a while at least until he was able to you know, finally uh, close the gap and, and narrow things down. So, yeah. Well, we, we go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was just, I was just going to say, we know Holmes understands trigonometry because of the, his experiences in the Musgrave ritual, but it's not clear what else his, uh, his other mathematic skills and talents um, might be. And it would be interesting to look at the, stories to try to get a sense of whether or not there's i'm sure somebody must have done this mm. other other well he does do he does do things like calculate the rate of trains and the the frequency of, of poles and mile markers and so on so we know he does have some it, it's, it would be an interesting topic you know for uh, for a paper well i'll tell you what let's pause that for just a moment and explore it a little more right after this word. The Baker Street Journal continues to be the leading Sherlockian publication since its founding in 1946 by Edgar W. Smith. In its pages, you'll find both serious scholarship and articles that play the game. The journal is essential reading for anyone interested in Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and a world where it's always 1895. If you subscribe to the Baker Street Journal, you'll get four quarterly issues as well as the Christmas Annual. You don't have to be a member of the BSI or of any Sherlockian society, for that matter, to subscribe to the journal. It's open to anyone who enjoys talking about, reading about, and writing about Sherlock Holmes. And you can also contribute to the BSJ. Only your imagination limits. Your imagination is the only limitation there. So get on the bandwagon and subscribe to the Baker Street Journal this year. Make it an important part of your commitment to the world of Sherlock Holmes. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and subscribe today. All right, we are back talking about 
Professor Moriarty and his mathematical ability. You know, one of the things that I, I have enjoyed in the, um, in the world of pastiche, and I'm, you know, we, we've talked about this before, uh, Bert. You and I aren't huge fans of pastiche. I think um, it's rare that one is done really well. And, of course, um, probably the uh, sine qua non of, of uh, pastiches is Nicholas Meyer's 7% Solution. Um, it, it's so well written and so fundamentally believable in terms of what happened in and around uh, the final problem and the great hiatus. And one of the things that Meyer's story uh, brings to the, the canon or the pseudo canon in that case, is that Sherlock Holmes had a mathematics tutor when he was a young man, a mathematics tutor by the name of Moriarty, right? So you think about the, the logic that Sherlock Holmes uses and how that must go hand in hand with an understanding of math. And to your point, just before the break, his ability to do back of the envelope, not even back of the envelope, back of the mind calculations on a train in Silver Blaze, you know, converting uh, measures and, and calculating time and determining how fast they were going. That's something that wouldn't come to your layman. Obviously, it didn't come to Watson, a man with scientific and medical knowledge, but Holmes must have understood math. And we're given to understand in uh, the final problem, really, which is the first time we come across Moriarty in print, that, quote, his, his career has been an extraordinary one. He's a man of good birth and excellent education, endowed by nature with a phenomenal mathematical faculty. At the age of 21, he wrote a treatise upon the binomial theorem, which has had a European vogue. On the strength of it, he won the mathematical chair at one of our smaller universities and had, to all appearance, a most brilliant career before him. So he had, he had mathematical faculty, uh, a mathematical faculty on his mind. He didn't even need a whole staff. He had the faculty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but who was the chair of the department and how much administration was involved and those meetings? Can you imagine how long the meetings probably were? <laughs> Oh, and, and you well, gotta grade the papers. No wonder he turned to crime. Absolutely, <laughs> he he couldn't get tenure, and also on a professor's pay. <laughs> right? My exactly. God, we drove this poor man to crime. Oh my goodness! So, um, the binomial theorem is this. Um, this is using silver and gold to uh, balance the economy, right? Oh yeah, that's exactly right. Oh. And to balance your balance your checkbook too. <laughs> I like that. Keep two sets of books. Um no, by that that was the bimetallic question. The binomial theorem. Um this is it's it's from um first round of algebra. Uh the binomial theorem it it describes the algebraic expansion of powers of a binomial. According to the theorem, it's possible to expand the polynomial that's x plus y to the n, into a sum involving the terms of ax to the b times y to the c, where the components b and c are non-negative integers, with b plus c equals n, and the coefficient a of each term is a specific positive integer, depending on n and b. For example, n equals 4. So, if we wanted to express this mathematically, instead of just speaking in code <laughs> to our listeners, um, it would be something like this. X plus Y to the fourth power, right? That, that uh, par parenthetical X plus Y quantity to the fourth power is equal to, <laughs> get ready, X to the fourth power plus 4x to the third power times y, plus 6x to the second power times y to the second power, plus 4x times y to the third power, plus y to the fourth power. Whew! Uh-huh. Can you imagine <laughs> having a whole treatise on that? I mean, look, uh, I, I am sure that there are talented mathematical wizards out there who can think just as plainly and clearly in numbers and expressions of numbers as we do in words. 
I don't pretend to be one of those people. I don't pretend to understand those people. I just get the heck out of their way so they can do what they do and amaze me. Yeah. Well, you know, two things about that. One is that I wish you would have gone a little slower because I've been trying to write all that down <laughs> and I hurt my slide rule. I got, you know, the palm of my hand caught in my slide rule. But the other thing is when I first read that, you know, about uh, the powers of a binomial, I'd been reading a lot of Marvel comics and I thought one of the powers of a binomial was heat vision. And so I got completely... <laughs> <laughs> completely i wondered who on the fantastic four had the powers of a binomial and um you know i think the powers of a binomial has to do with the game of three card monty you know so if you can double and find look if you can find, wait a minute if you can find the queen and double your bet then no wait a minute that's backgammon oh, i'm completely confused now wow this is quite the queen's gambit here <laughs> Checkmate. <laughs> Check, please. Um, Check, yeah. please. Yes. Well, it, we'll we'll have a link to the binomial theorem as as Wikipedia explains it, which is where I was reading from. Um, well, wait a minute. Can't we have two links to the binomial theorem? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but then you'd have to cube it and divide by the third power of y to the n. Um, oh, now, wait a second. Hilton Cubit is a completely different story. You know, I can't wait to see what our transcription <laughs> service makes of this. <laughs> they're just, they're just going to throw up numbers back on the page to us. Well, you can see, I mean, the, the, the ultimate uh, point of this discussion is it's complex, and it was meant to be complex. Um, certainly, mathematics 150 years ago uh, was not as advanced as it is today. But at the same time, um, you know, Bert, you, you mentioned your slide rule. There were not the same kinds of instruments to be able to do quick calculations. You know, we, we hold in, in the palm of our hand every day supercomputers. And when the first calculator came along, you know, that, that was thought to be an amazing thing. And, and the computing power that we have uh, in, in a calculator even is something that required, you know, a full room of major mainframe computers at one point and 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 uh systems where you had to feed in uh, uh punch cards uh to be read or, or the real the real tapes right all of that was going on in moriarty's brain and in sherlock holmes's brain so well one of the lovely things about dynamics of the asteroid is that it's all also caught the attention of some of the creative folks who've brought homes to the screen and you can find lots of echoes of the dynamics of an asteroid you know for example in uh in the bbc sherlock i mm. think it was sherlock's mother who had written a textbook with the title of the dynamics of combustion which was sort of a half-handed uh, off off-handed reference to the book and i think in in elementary although i'm not nearly as big a fan of elementary as my friend james o'leary is the one, I think the 100th episode of Elementary uh, had a plot uh, that revolved around miscalculating near-Earth asteroids and the threat mm. to human existence and so on. Interesting. Okay. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned before that this um, mass of asteroids between Jupiter and Mars, that's typically known as the asteroid belt. And uh, when I first saw his full bibliography, I thought that was uh, what what... Conan Doyle was originally writing about in the Poison Belt, that there was uh, some zone, you know, uh, not an actual physical belt. So um, I'm going to put on my Poison Belt and my, my asteroid braces and uh, <laughs> see what that holds up. Well, look, if you're going to eat like Holmes did occasionally at Simpsons in the Strand, you're going to have to let out your asteroid belt by a notch or two. <laughs> and and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. What are my bid? Russia bids 5,000. Russia 
bids five thousand pounds. Rubles. Rubles. All right. Now then, let's see. <clears throat> there are eight rubles to the pound, so we simply divide five thousand by eight. Eight into fifty goes six. Six eights are forty-eight. Carry the two. Bring down the zero. Eight into twenty goes twice. Eight to sixteen. Four over. We can carry over the four. Bring down the zero. Eight into forty goes five times. Russia bids six hundred and twenty-five pounds. Good thing I'm a math professor. <laughs> Seven thousand. Seven thousand rubles. French francs. Fr French francs. Of course. Right, get the daily paper. France bid 7,000 French francs. What's the franc going for today? Uh, the franc is 11.18. The franc is 11.18 to the pound. So, I simply put down 11.18. Oh, Christ, how do you do this? Well, did you put down 11.18? Oh, sure, I wouldn't know even to put down 11.18. What I'm asking you, idiot, is whether you multiply or divide. Divide. Are you sure? Yes. I'll kill you if you screw this up. Now then, we simply divide 11.18 into 7,000. What do I do with the decimal point? You move the decimal point two places to the right. You mean I divide 1118 into 7,000? 7, 700,000. What? Well, you add two zeros to the 7,000 to make up for moving the decimal point two places to the right. Well, what the hell did we move the decimal point for in the first place? To make it easier. All right. The bidding will start at 5,000 pounds. 5,000. 8,000. 10. 12,000. 15. 17. 18. 19. 20. 24. 29. 30. 